The Taliban go on a media offensive as new reporting highlights the behind the scenes failures that led to that chaotic U.S. departure from Afghanistan. Plus, the governor of Texas has COVID and Pete Buttigieg going to be a daddy. Wednesday need to know. Let's go. Good morning. This is Cheddar's Need to Know podcast for August 18th. And as you can hear, I am Carlo Versano, which means only one thing. Yes, you hear his little laugh there. My brother from another mother, Baker Machado, here Good with us to today, filling you. in for Jill. Carlo. Baker, always a pleasure. Good to see you, Carlo. Good to see you're back in the panic room in Long Island again this week. How much longer are you there, by the way? Uh, another week or so, oh uh, but yeah, he, out, here, out here with my family, it's been very nice. I, have I was to gonna say. say, you've been stuck in a house with like in your in-laws, your wife, oh, yeah. your new baby. Like for a lot of us, that would be like a 15 on the anxious scale already. So the fact <laughs> that you've survived this is amazing. Yeah, and I feel bad because every time I mention little Franny on this podcast, it's in the context of her being this like little mini terrorist. Right. But it's not fair to her. It's not fair to her. She is she is the cutest little baby of I've course. ever seen. I love her. I love her more every day. You're legally uh, and obligated I don't mean to, to say that though. <laughs> yes, but it happens to be true, and I don't mean to give her a uh, a hard time on the pod. And you should see her. She's starting to get uh, these little rolls. She's getting like that oh, chubbiness. The, oh, God. the chunky rolls are one of my favorite the, parts of the babies. It's too much. I just want to like eat her up. It's too much. Um, okay. Well, anyway, on that note, by the way, a little housekeeping. Uh, everyone who emailed in over the last day or two, my, I, I am like way behind on my email. So we will get back to you. Uh, fear not. I'll try and get to those today. Um, and yes, so Jill's out today. She's out tomorrow. Uh, she was going to do a little um, mini vacation with her husband, but I think sadly she's still in quarantine. Uh, oh, so we're wishing her day. well. But yeah, uh, so let's get to it, Baker. All right, let's dive right into the news and let's start with another day with the latest in Afghanistan, Carlo. Having completed their offensive blitz over the last little while, the Taliban now starting a media blitz. They are moving quickly to consolidate power in Afghanistan and they held news conferences and conducted media interviews, all meant to assure Afghans that the militant group will not retaliate against those who worked with U.S. forces over the last two decades and also calling for Afghan women to join the new government. That, of course, despite its history of oppression and violence. Zebahala Muhadid, that's the Taliban's longtime spokesperson, made his very first ever public appearance. All to say that the country is not going to be used as a safe haven for terrorists as it was pre-9-11. Meanwhile, Carlo, more U.S. troops have landed in Kabul, this to secure the airport and speed up the pace of the air evacuations. I think I saw yesterday the Pentagon spokesperson uh, is b under the assumption that this will at least take until the end of the month before U.S. forces are officially out of that airport. Yeah, so Mark Mazzetti, a uh, reporter for The New York Times, he wrote the story Great yesterday reporter. that I was waiting for, which was, which is, yeah, the inside account of just what the hell went wrong with the intelligence um, with this. Because this was a, this sort of chaotic withdrawal was an intelligence failure as much as it was a failure of execution. Um, and, you know, you always have to take these kinds of stories, these like behind the scenes TikToks, take them with a grain of salt because it's usually what it is, is just anonymous intelligence officials pointing their finger at the White House Correct. and then anonymous Correct. White House officials pointing their finger at the intelligence community. It's all like a blame game thing. That said, if you just sort of like read a little bit between the lines, the basic gist of this article seems accurate, and I'll sort of try and summarize it here. It pretty much goes that until the summer, the intelligence assessments out of CIA were all in agreement that the government, the Afghan government was going to fall to the Taliban, but the question was when. And until July, those assessments were that the government could hang, hang on for as mm -hmm. much as 18 months to two years. Then... In July last month, the assessment started getting much bleaker, and they were warning the White House that Kabul could actually fall in months or even weeks, and the Afghan military, military was at risk of just an immediate collapse for a variety of reasons. So it sounds like, again, sort of reading between the lines here, what happened was Biden was forced to make a game-time decision, which was either punt the September withdrawal deadline after making such a big deal about it going, going forward with it, and then give us sort of more time to secure the exit. Right. Or gamble and gamble that those intelligence reports were wrong, as they have been many times, uh, and stay the course, betting that the Taliban would abide by its promise to the Trump administration in those negotiations in Doha last year that they were going to give us some time to get out. 
So Biden took that bet and he lost it. Clearly, he's paying for it politically. He is going to be crucified by the Republicans over this next year. If you think you saw a lot of those videos out of the Kabul airport over the last couple of days, that you're going to see a lot of those during the midterms next year. And frankly, in my opinion, he deserves it because this was, when it comes down to it, a failure on the part of the commander in chief. Look, Carlo, even just a few months ago, Joe Biden was even telling the press that, you know, the expectation here was that the Taliban was not going to take over as fast as they as yeah. they were, even though reporters were pressing him otherwise. So it was almost like the president, uh, again, as you yeah. mentioned, this reporting seems to in, uh, indicate that the president knew that the Taliban was speeding up the processes here, but either way was still basically telling the American people that this wasn't going to happen as fast as it was. And by the way, we, again, the expectation here was that the Taliban was going to take over Afghanistan. It wasn't a matter of if, but when, but the assessment right. from the intelligence community basically was going to be months, maybe even years, definitely not days. The larger question now is essentially, what does the Taliban do now? What is this new t sort of Taliban that we're basically now forced to sort of reckon with here? Is this the Taliban of the old, which they tell us that they're not, the one that uh, harbors organizations like Al-Qaeda before 9-11? What sort of relationship do they have with women and girls. Uh, the reports on the ground already is that, are that girls uh, are not going back to school right now, that um, burqas are selling out all across stores. That was Clarissa Ward's report from CNN yesterday uh, because women apparently make up about 40% of the workforce in Afghanistan. And now the worries is that some of them are being ushered out of offices right now. Now the Taliban is saying that they're still going to uh, uh, st stick by their strict Muslim um, uh, rule of code, but that they're they're trying to modernize them a little bit as well. So who knows exactly what sort of Taliban right. all of us are going to be getting here. Well, meanwhile, Carlo, let's get to some other stuff regarding all of this. Um, the EU is preparing for an influx of Afghan migrants and could rival the 2015 refugee crisis that we saw in Syria. The geopolitical conditions have also changed since then, and countries like Germany that opened their doors to those migrants now signaling that they'll be less hospitable this time around. And as for former U.S. President George W. Bush, well, he's among those urging the Biden administration to cut the red tape and also expedite the process for Afghans who are trying to flee. Taliban rule. Carla, when we look at a lot of the political finger pointing that's been going on over the last uh, week or so, you have Democrats pointing the finger at the Trump administration, the Trump administration pointing the finger over at the Biden administration. But the person that's been really lost in this conversation is former President George W. Bush. He's the reason why we went to Afghanistan yeah. 20 years ago. So I made the mistake of turning on some of the cable news coverage uh, yesterday. First of all, don't do that because it'll drive you crazy. Actually, you know what? That's not fair because, like you said, there are reporters at, at the cable networks and the broadcast networks mm -hmm. that are doing amazing work in that country. Richard yes. Engel at NBC, Clarissa Ward at CNN. So I don't, they're risking their lives to bring you the news. So I don't want to yeah. belittle that. It's the talking heads that they have on CNN That's and the MS. Problem. And That's always the problem. It's just uh, – it, it's – I, you know, I was just watching this procession of these pundits reverting to this stale debate about whether we should have ended the war at all, which, as I said, it, it's not the debate worth having. The debate worth having is about how we, we fudged Correct. and the, 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 the actual withdrawal. But first of all, first of all, if you worked in the George W. Bush administration, I don't want to hear your opinions, first of all, about anything, but certainly, certainly not about anything related to the Middle East. And that goes for Nicole Wallace, Bush's former communications director, who's now a host on MSNBC. That goes for David Frum, Bush's former speechwriter, who wrote the Axis of Evil speech, arguably launching our whole misadventures yep. in the in Middle Iraq. East. Yep. He's Yes, he's now uh, a columnist with The Atlantic, and he's always on CNN. And honestly, frankly, it goes for George W. Bush himself, uh, even though I happen to agree with what he said about refugees. But it seems to me that the argument that's coalescing is that you know, we had created this stalemate in Afghanistan that we could just sort of continue in perpetuity, right? After all, American soldiers were no longer getting regularly killed in combat there. The last combat death that we had was back in February of 2020. And right. hey, after all, like, don't we have 30,000 troops in Korea, another 35,000 or so in Germany? What's another few thousand keeping the peace in Kabul? The problem, you know, those forces in Germany and Korea were sent there after those wars to maintain these fragile post-war peace deals, and they succeeded without much in the way of casualties. That is all true. But that's not a one-to-one -one comparison with Afghanistan. The reason that the Taliban had mostly stopped attacking us in the last year, year and a half, two years, is it because they woke up one day and decided that we were no longer, you know, infidels uh, occupying their land? It's because they knew that we were leaving. 
and they didn't want us to keep staying and realized that if they started shooting us again, we would probably keep staying, right? If we were staying for some open-ended period of time, those troops in that country would still be in danger. It would still be a war, right? It wouldn't be Korea, it wouldn't be Germany. So the question, to me at least, then becomes, right, after 20 years, how many additional American casualties in Afghanistan can we as a country accept? Is it 100? Is it 10? Is it one? I thought it was sort of settled that the number that most Americans accept in that country is zero. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, just just remember, as you just said, right, this war was lost a long time ago. It was lost back when Barack Obama and Joe Biden were just senators uh, and Donald Trump was nothing more than a game show host and a tabloid punchline <laughs> in New York City. None of those people got us into our post 9-11 psychosis in the Middle East, right? Which just brings me back to the sort of whitewashing of the Bush administration that you're starting to see. And at the end of the day, George Bush and his administration are responsible for getting us into this utter two decade failure of American foreign policy in the Middle East and specifically in Afghanistan. Well, the only thing I would add to that, Carlo, is this is why a lot of Democratic strategists I've been seeing and I've been reading believe the political fallout for Joe Biden you know, he's going to be scrutinized for the for basically the evacuation plans and getting people out. But mm -hmm. this is why when you saw in his speech the other day, he said, how many more American lives did you want me to to lose in a war that's not even ours? This is a war for the Afghan people. And he's saying that because polling shows the American people, 70 percent of Americans on both sides of the political aisle do not want to be in Afghanistan. So Joe Biden, even though it's a bungled fallout, is betting that most Americans wanted to be out of Afghanistan and that he's going to get support on that. This is why, as you mentioned, Republicans are going to use and campaign the, the fallout of what happened in Afghanistan as sort of the campaign thing to go against him, not necessarily pulling troops out of that country. Right. I got to say, I am so, as one political junkie to another, I am so um, curious about the polling on this because I would think that Biden's going to take a big hit after oh, this week. Yes. Yeah. But, but is there an argument that his numbers go up? Is it? Is there? I, we'll, we'll see. I think it's unlikely. But to your point, people in this country are so sick of this war and do not care about what happens in this country, in Afghanistan, that it's possible that just by virtue of actually pulling the Band-Aid off, he could actually get a bump. I don't think he, that's he might, likely. I think I think the images from the last couple of days are really going to hurt him. I think it, things are so heavily uh, polarized right now in this country anyway that, you know, Republicans are going to make this as a big issue for them. But at the end of the day, when you ask most people in polls, the number one and number two questions that most people are really caring about right now is COVID in the economy. Yep. You know, what's happening in Afghanistan and potentially terrorism is, is still not, it's not, it's still in the top five, but it's not as big as yep. the economy and what's happening with COVID. And on the topic of COVID, let's talk about what's happening in Texas. The governor there, Greg Abbott, has tested positive, Carlo, for COVID, and he is receiving Regeneron's uh, antibody treatment despite being fully vaccinated. Now, Abbott is now the 11th governor now known to have test positive since the pandemic started. He's also also one of the few governors to ban mask mandates anywhere in the state, leading to one Texas school district making masks part of its dress code to try to get around Abbott's executive order. Uh, we should note Greg Abbott is quarantining right now, but this is pretty interesting because I don't know if it's going to change the conversation too much when it comes to his perspective on COVID because President Trump it also never does. Tested, no. tr President Trump also tested positive for COVID, also took the Regeneron um, you know, antibody treatment as well, and his perspective when it came to masks and COVID didn't really change either. Yeah, nobody ever learns anything. What I don't understand, though, is how Abbott is on Regeneron if he was fully vaccinated. That suggests, I think, that he's that very serious. sick. It's a serious. It's a serious case, correct. But, and that's, and that's, and that's yeah, also, be, and that was also, by the way, Maggie Haberman, was, and during her reporting on President Trump getting sick with COVID, if you're taking the Regeneron antibody treatment, that seems to indicate that your, your case of COVID seems to be pretty severe. Right. Remember when he got Trump got that and he was like miraculously cured and he came out and he was like, this Regeneron treatment is the best thing oh, in the ever. world, folks. Yes. I'm, I'm yes. going to I'm going to get it for I'm, everyone, everyone who it, wants yes. it. He was like, everyone who wants it is going to have it. And like, yes. it's still like twenty five thousand dollars. And oh, only yeah. people like Greg Abbott get it. That was like so gross to me that yeah. that happened. And like nobody, nobody even paid it any money. It was like an infomercial. Uh, anyway. It was like an infomercial yeah. when Trump posted that on his on his Twitter account. 
I mean, how are you going to tell people that like there's this miraculous cure to this virus and I'm just going to give it away and then just not ever do it at all? Because anyway, I think, I, but um, I, but I, just yeah. really quickly to say that, because I think then people then think, oh, well, then COVID can't, I'm not going to take it as seriously because I already know that there's treatments right. out there that have saved other people. So it gives them this sort of like reassurance that yeah. it, they're going to be fine at the end of the day, which we're seeing yeah. now with ICU beds filling up in Texas and Florida. That's not the case. Yeah, that Regeneron treatment is amazing, but it's not like, first of all, there's not that much of it, Correct. and it's extremely expensive. Correct. So it's not like it's just, it's not like you're, it's like penicillin, right? Anyway, I, what I wanted to say is there's a little bit of good news here. The pace of vaccinations is back up to the levels that we haven't seen since late May, when the sort of like original vaccine push was still happening. We're doing half a million new shots a day now, mostly in the South, which is good since that's where yep. uh, the, the bulk of the new cases are coming from. So let's just hope that we can keep that up, right? Absolutely. The, the, the other thing I would note yesterday, um, I think half of the COVID deaths now in this country are literally coming from two states. They're coming from Texas and from Florida right now, Carlos. So mm -hmm. obviously, but it's good to see that at least those numbers continuing to tick up. Uh, let's talk about mm -hmm. the death toll that happened uh, in Haiti. It continues to rise. It's now approaching 2,000 with nearly 10,000 people injured. Survivors have been using makeshift shelters to keep safe. That is the area near the epicenter of the quake was hit with flooding and mudslides from Tropical Storm Grace. Now, the recovery effort is still slow going, in part because only the road linking the southern part of the country to the capital has come under fire from armed gangs. Uh, Carla, the infrastructure in Haiti, they still haven't even recovered from the earthquake that happened 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And the worry is, is that there might be bodies buried underneath rubble uh, in addition to the mudslides that are there. So nobody's going to be able to get an accurate death count uh, out there because who knows if you're going to be able to find most of the people there and the worry is is that this earthquake was larger in terms of size than the one that they had 10 years ago which cost yeah. you know thousands and thousands and thousands of lives that I, that was one of the first big stories that i covered when i worked at nbc and i remember just a quick quick aside here um i was working on the assignment desk at nbc when that earthquake hit uh and we covered it wall to wall for 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 weeks mm -hmm. um and just just in terms of like you know, one of the one of the things I'm most sort of, I guess, proud of in my career is there was a, a story um, our, that our reporters on the ground had, had had were talking about all of the children, all of the orphans in that country from the earthquake. Um, and somebody who was watching uh, NBC Nightly News called us, called us on the news desk and they said, we want to help put us in, you know, put us in touch with those 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 orphanages, you know, what can we do? And they called us back a while later and said that because of that, they were, that family was able to um, adopt one of those, oh, one of those amazing. little boys from Haiti. Yeah. So I just, anyway, that was just, that always made me feel good. But Journalism for it, it good, just, Carlo. And I yes, want to see why that's right. a good moment for you. <laughs> Yes, uh, for all the bad ones, there are some good ones. But it just shows you. I mean, these people. I know I've said it before. These just so unlucky. I know. Um, they need so much help. And just to that end, um, I linked to a good list of vetted organizations that are doing amazing mm -hmm. work in Haiti. Uh, like I, these people need so much help. Um, and anything you can do to help them goes a long way. The, the footage out of that country is just heartbreaking. Some of these people making these makeshift campsites that were then blown over from that tropical storm. Just insult to injury. And I don't know. What what else to do to just pray for them and to send help however we can. Absolutely, Carlos. So well said. Meanwhile, let's move to Naomi Osaka. She returned to face questions from the media for the very first time since she pulled out of the French Open back in May. That after she refused to speak to reporters and this press conference, Carlo, also ended in tears back in front of the press ahead of the tournament in Ohio. Osaka took three questions before a columnist from the Cincinnati Enquirer had asked the tennis star how she balanced her aversion to the media with, quote, a lot of outside interests that are served by having a media platform. Osaka answered the question, but then she broke down in tears before she left the podium all to compose herself. She has just not had a very lucky string at all with media reporters, Carlo. So her agent uh, called this reporter a, quote, bully whose, quote, sole purpose was to intimidate. I watched this whole thing. That seems absolutely absurd to me, to be honest. I mean, this guy was asking, I think, a fair question. Uh, I don't know what his intentions were other than to get a, a, a honest answer out of her and he commended uh, her by the way he about about yeah. her, about her mental health and all of that and basically talking about that yeah i, I just attacking the media is like such a I, I i hate it when trump does it i hate it when osaka does it i hate it when anybody does it because it's a lazy um, excuse I, most in most very, cases it's, it's a lazy excuse 
Yeah, and I mean, look, I think a lot of the sports media is kind of useless. Um, these pre- these pregame press conferences are certainly useless. They're they're very antiquated, but it's sort of part of the deal, right? right. It's part of the deal. We in the media make you rich and famous, and you, the athlete give us vague answers to our questions about like how you plan on winning the match or something when they just say like, well, hard work and uh, a lot of focus. That's how or, we're or you can it. just say I'm I, here so I don't get fined like that NFL yes. player did. <laughs> yeah, ex- exactly. <laughs> Do that. I don't know. I'm very, I, I'm sort of over her. I, I, I think I don't, I don't really, I, I find there's something sort of uh, uncouth about how she has operated here as this, you know, she's in Vogue, she's on Nike billboards, but like, okay, well that's, you know, you're, you're a star. So you're going to make millions of dollars being on Nike billboards. You should talk to the media. It's not that hard. Yeah, no, it's going to be interesting to see what her press strategy is going to be moving forward, Carlo, because we've kind of seen with the Players' Tribune and all these other sorts of outlets, uh, athletes like celebrities in many cases being able to control almost everything about their image from the press that they're doing to the interviews to the crafting of the story. So it'll be kind of interesting to see sort of what her media strategy is and if she does some sort of different outlet down the road. Uh, I do want to switch gears and talk about some good baby news coming out of Washington. Yes. Pete and Chastity. And Buttigieg, their daddies, Carlo, the transportation secretary and his husband announced that they're welcoming their first child, noting that the process not done just yet, but that they're overjoyed at becoming parents. Now, the happy news is a marker of visibility for same sex couples, given the fact that Buttigieg, the first openly gay cabinet member in U.S. history to be confirmed by the Senate. Incredible news for these guys. They didn't say, though, by the way, which I think I'm intrigued to see how they're actually the process of how they're going through this. And I'm only saying this is um, somebody who is also having this conversation with my husband. He just turned 40. So he's sort of having this existential crisis about sort of what you do <laughs> in the next phase of your life. Do you yeah. have a kid? Do you not? And the good thing is, as, as gay couples, we can have that conversation uh, because it, it, it is a big hurdle for us to have kids. So you ha- kind of have a different mindset about starting a family than most heterosexual couples. Um, but it is not a cheap process. Process for gays. I mean, if you yeah. do the adoption process, we have friends that is they've gone through heartbreak during the adoption process where they thought they've had a kid, then they end up losing the kid. Uh, it Ugh. costs like $50,000. It's insane. And then on the other side, if you do the surrogate process, which a lot of people don't know, just finally became legal here in the state of New York. It was illegal for the longest period of time. It's that amazing co- to me. Yeah, it, it's crazy. It, with how blue of a state this is that we only just recently allowed surrogacy, uh, it is also a very expensive process. We're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars to do this because you can't add the surrogate to your insurance, so you have to pay everything out of pocket. Also, the miscarry rate is incredibly high because you're essentially putting an egg um, and and sperm that is not part of the other person's DNA into their system, so of course they're going to try to flush it out. It is a nightmare process across the board, so I am so happy when it finally works out for people, and it's and for Chastity and Pete, this is a great yeah. moment for them yeah i it's, it's so funny these things right like i had no i don't really have any idea about any of that like we just sort of did it the old-fashioned way and it worked and like it's just <laughs> it's it's always it's always yes. amazing to me how, how how many struggles people have and you know it's it's just so many of us forget about that how easy we have it um Anyway, yeah, because yeah, yeah, so many straight couples, it's like, oh, yeah, how did it all happen? Oh, yeah, it was a drunk, you know, crazy night at the bar right. on Saturday, <laughs> and then it happened, you know? But, yeah, well, anyway, mazel to them. That's amazing news. By the way, did you, I don't know if you read this, there was a, 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 a Washington Post style section profile of Jason Buttigieg a couple of weeks ago <laughs> that I, it was like, it, it really made me feel for him. It was just like, it was kind of like all about how he he's this kind of like fish out of water in DC totally, because totally. he's married he's married to Mayor Pete who is this right. like very much very much a political creature oh, 100%. and an ambitious one at that and he's right. just kind of like hanging out sort of like getting getting kind of overweight during COVID and right, his pants yes. don't fit him anymore. Right. No, he, he mentioned that in his tweets. I remember him yeah. saying that, and then there were like. And you could, and since you read the piece, I didn't get the chance to read it, but I remember Twitter was really making fun of them because they were making a comment about how expensive real estate and renting an apartment is in Washington. And I can't even remember how much they spent on, uh, per month on their apartment, but people were like, how, wait, a one bedroom apartment costs you how much money? And people were like, I, yeah. I can spend that much money in Washington and I have a great apartment. I don't know what you're talking about. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, the whole pe- the whole piece comes. You you come away with the sense that like they are not. Uh, I don't know that maybe they were on the outs, but but obviously not, and that's great news for them um, with this baby. So mazel to them, and mazel to you, Baker, for yes. joining us on this lovely podcast today. Oh, and, and Carlo. Bringing us- oh. Just wait until this is over until we get canceled. You won't be thanking me then. Uh, Carlo, we got to <laughs> talk about some big news from Netflix. They released the first images of the upcoming season five of The Crown, which I'm so excited about. This one features Dominic West as Prince Charles. I think he pulls it off pretty well. Also, Elizabeth Debicki is Princess Di. Uh, of course, if you want to uh, see the pics, you can try out a link in the newsletter for them. Uh, Dominic West, I have always sort of had this weird crush on Dominic West, dating all the way back to The Wire. Um, I loved him in The Affair. I don't know if you ever watched that show, although it did kind yeah. of like fall off the cliff. It was the good last for a little bit. Yeah. The, thir- the first like season, eh, maybe second season, okay, but the rest, then it got really weird. And then I saw him at a laundromat in Williamsburg. And when you finally like see like a celeb in real life, you know, I'm going to borrow a phrase from Tina Fey in uh, Mean Girls. It's like seeing your teacher or like a dog like walk on its hind legs or something <laughs> like that. She says that when you see a teacher out in the open. Uh, but uh, either way, The Crown is so good. I'm so excited that Dominic West is part of it. Uh, and this is going to be a good one because I think a lot of people know the storyline about Princess Di m- probably more than other parts of the Queen. So I feel like there's going to be a real connection that the audience has with this next season of The Crown because this is a moment in history that they at least lived through that they understand. Yeah, I'm excited for it. Dominic West, I think he's too handsome to play Prince Charles. Becky and I were debating this <laughs> last night. He he is a he is a good looking fellow. But yes, um, he is. Baker, I was going to use this as an opportunity for us to do some recommendations about what we're watching, but we're going over. So let's save that for tomorrow. You're back oh, tomorrow. Yes, right? I am. Yes. All and right. by the way, I'm going to give you cr- uh, major pubs for tomorrow because I'm obsessed with a show that you told me like six months ago to watch and I'm obsessed with it. Oh, okay. All right. So we'll save that for tomorrow, guys. Uh, Until then, thank you again, Baker. And that is what you need to know for Wednesday, August 18th.